man, perceiving himself as a unique creature in all of creation. For he's been led to believe that he alone has been given a mind to think, to invent, to create. In just this century, man's growing curiosity has led him to make more discoveries than ever before in history. He discovered the innermost secrets of nature. He desired to manipulate genetic code controlling human life, and did it. He pictured flight in his mind, and now walks on the moon. And now his curiosity has led him to explore the greatest mystery of all, his own mind, that very source from which all ideas, thoughts, behavior, desires, and creativity arises, the mind looking into itself. For the ancient mystics taught that hidden within the mind, will be found the answer to all creation. But what has science found as it probes the mind? It has found that chemicals can alter the mind. When studying the mind, science has found one of the most mystifying phenomena yet, that man can be placed into a trance-like state called hypnosis. And while in the state is able to experience a world beyond reality, even making him seemingly able to transcend physical and mental limitations. Perhaps this hypnotic state is the door through which the answer to the mind's mysteries will be discovered. What you're about to see is based upon fact. Some will find it fascinating, and some may even find it frightening. So, with thanks to the scientific community, we now bring you Hypnosis and Beyond. Throughout history, it has been believed that certain individuals could influence others by the use of some undefined power, a power that could be used for good or evil. In ancient Egypt, over 5,000 years ago, records show that the priests knew techniques to induce sleep states, today called hypnosis, that would bring about miraculous cures. In the sleep temples, the priests would place the subject into a trance-like state. When they would awaken, they would be cured. This form of healing was known to be practiced by other cultures, Persians, Tibetans, Indian yogis, Chinese, American Indians. Even the royal courts of Europe knew of this power. But it was Franz Anton Mesmer, a Viennese physician of the 18th century, who brought this power to the attention of modern science. Franz Anton Mesmer believed there was a life force which could be channeled to cure sickness and that he could transmit this energy to heal. It was to be called mesmerizing. This is Paris. It was here, Place Vendôme, that Mesmer selected to install himself to receive his patients. It is in this building that he achieved his success. Here the French nobility and others arrived and went to Mesmer to be treated. The atmosphere was almost theatrical. The lighting indirect, the carpets thick and lush, incense burned, soft music played. Mesmer appeared in long flowing robes, carrying a staff of iron. His patients were already gathered around an enormous wooden tub, projecting a number of iron rods which had been magnetized by Mesmer. Mesmer instructed his patients to take hold of the rods. Laying his hands on some, fixing his gaze on others, Mesmer circulated throughout the room until suddenly convulsive seizures would come over them. His patients would scream, moan, writhe, shriek, fall to the ground, then suddenly relax. And amazingly, they were cured. Unaware, Mesmer showed us not only the power of the mind over the body, but the limitless possibilities of suggestion. Other charismatic figures would discover for themselves the power to influence and control by using methods of mass suggestion. Throughout history, there have been powerful orators who so aroused men's minds that they would be ready to follow and believe in anything suggested to them. It's to be strong, to act with other great freedom-loving nations, and to make it plain to the aggressor 
while time remains, that we shall rally the free men of the world. But there were other orators whose skill would turn nations towards other ends. Adolf Hitler was perhaps the greatest orator of his time. He was somehow able to tap the emotional atmosphere of a crowd so that each person felt confidence, trust, and belief in him. And by the end of his speech, he so numbed the critical faculties of his listeners that they were prepared to believe and do almost anything he suggested. And we were to be strongly reminded again in 1978 of the power of persuasion by gaining people's confidence, trust, and belief. When Jim Jones of the People's Temple would influence and control those who followed him. I owe something to my people, and that's to be a good pastor, and that I am, the best I am. If you want to go out and tell them something that I stand for about social action, social justice, ask me your questions, and I'll tell you right straight from the shoulder where I stand. You want to get out there? I'll tell you. Please, for God's sake, let's get on with it. We've lived, we've lived as no other people have lived and loved. We've had as much of this world as you're going to get. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. I would suspect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. If the power of persuasion can manipulate people so dramatically, then it's important to understand why. In its simplest form, persuasion is an everyday phenomena. The salesman convinces us to buy his product. The impassioned plea of the lawyer sways the jury's verdict. The politician's influence wins the election. And faith in the power of the healer heals the sick. But what's the key to all this? Faith, trust? or the power of suggestion? Scientists have asked these questions from the beginning. Now, the power of suggestion is being studied in the laboratory using the phenomenon of hypnosis. You will see demonstrations of hypnosis. In no way should you, as a non-professional, attempt to duplicate these experiments. Falling forward. These more subjects more are all volunteers and are here for the purpose of participating in these experiments. The man conducting these experiments is Dr. Martin Orn, director of the Unit for Experimental Psychiatry at the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital and University of Pennsylvania, a leading authority on hypnosis and consultant to various government agencies. These volunteer subjects are listening to a tape recording. This tape recording has been designed to induce hypnosis. Hypnosis depends upon the subject, and therefore, an individual who wants to respond will do so to the best of his ability. Some people will do better than others. Here, they're responding to a tape recording done by a radio announcer because we wanted it to have particularly good English diction. This man had never hypnotized anyone, but now he's hypnotized more people than anybody in the history of the world. Relax all the muscles of your body. The following audio Let portion of this program has been altered for the protection of the viewing audience. Relax more and more. Please extend your left arm straight out in front of you, up in the air, and make a fist. 
arm straight out in front of you. I want you to pay attention to this arm and imagine that it is becoming stiff, stiffer and stiffer, rigid, like a bar of iron. Test how stiff and rigid it is. Try to bend it. Try. Now just stop trying to bend your arm and relax. Stop trying to bend your arm and relax. Very relaxed. I am sure that you have paid so close attention to what we have been doing that you have not noticed the fly which has been buzzing about you buzzing annoyingly. Go ahead and get rid of it if you want to. It's gone, and you are no longer annoyed. These subjects asleep? may look asleep, but you'll see that they're responding at all times. They're aware of what is going on, even when they look asleep. The brain waves are the same as if they're awake. The, the knee reflex, the knee jerk, remains the same as awake. One part of the individual always does remain awake, while the other responds to suggestion and creates the private world, which is hypnosis. You will open your eyes. You will have difficulty in remembering all the things I have told you. At one, you will be awake. You will hear a tapping noise, like this. When you hear the tapping noise, you will reach down and touch your left ankle. Ready? Three. Two. One. Wake up. Any remaining drowsiness which you may feel will quickly pass. What is post-hypnotic suggestion? How does it work? You're drifting deep and deeper. You're going to find two very interesting things occurring after you awaken. But right now, as your right hand rapidly floats upward into the air, floating upward toward your forehead, and you'll feel the number six as if it were in braille on your forehead. That's right. And it's there now. Can you feel it now? And now you're going to wipe it off, and as you do, the number six will disappear completely from your mind. It will not exist in your vocabulary. It will not exist in your mind. Count from one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's correct. And as your hand drops down, it will continue to not exist. It will not exist even after you awaken. There's one other interesting thing that you'll find, and that is I have a pen. As your eyes open, you'll see a pen, but you'll remain asleep. You see this pen? Yes. This pen will weigh a ton, so that when you try to pick it up, it will barely even budge. You can't even slide it, it's so heavy. The pen, the whole pen weighs a ton. When you wake up, you won't recall what I've told you. You'll feel wonderful, refreshed, and awake. Wonderful, refreshed, and awake, but the things will happen as I've told you. All right, as I count from three to one, you'll awaken. Three, two, one, wide awake. How do you feel? I feel great. Good. Would you do me a favor and count from one to ten? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, would you count by your fingers? There's something which bothers me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hmm. What's, what's funny? Would you count my fingers? One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. How do you explain that? I don't know. We're supposed to have ten fingers. Well, never mind that for a moment. 
Here, uh, would you just have a look at this pen? It's a very interesting pen. Could you give it to me? It's really heavy. What have you got in the pen? The story of the Manchurian candidate fascinated many. The wartime drama of a man who committed murder while under the control of hypnotic suggestion. If you can control behavior with hypnosis, can you make a person perform an act against his conscious will? More and more relaxed and comfortable, sinking deeper, deeper. Now your hand will drop down. And now your eyes will open and you'll remain in deep trance. You'll remain in deep trance. You still hear only my voice. Can you hear anything else at all? That's right. Nothing will bother you. You'll be quite comfortable. Come with me and I will show you what to do. Just come with me. That's right. There, careful. There's a step here. Just that's right. Now I'd like you to just watch here and you'll see that a coin will be placed there. And I want you to pick it up and put it in this bag. That's right. There we go. And take it, there'll be a piece of chalk placed there. Pick it up and put it in this bag. That's right. And next will be a small, harmless snake. Pick it up behind the head. That's right. And put it in here. That's right. All the way, make sure it's in. That's right, and now there'll be a large snake which you'll pick up behind the head. Behind the head. Quickly. Quickly. Let go. That's right, and your eyes are closing now and you're sinking deeper. And as I ask you to open your eyes, you're going to be aware that there's a beaker in front of you. Do not touch the beaker. And there will be two other beakers also in front of you. You look at them. It's all right to open your eyes now. You'll see the beakers. Now I want you to focus on this beaker, because shortly I'll ask you to do something. This beaker you want to be careful of because it is filled with acid. It is nitric acid. You've had chemistry, haven't you? And you know that in nitric acid dissolves copper. I'm going to put a penny into the acid. Look what happens. Now I want you to reach in with your hand and pick up the penny out of the acid and put it into this beaker. Take it very quickly. Go ahead. Put it in, that's right. Just put your whole hand and close your eyes. Nothing else at all. Nothing else at all. Only my voice. Nothing else at all, that's right. That's right. All right, now I want you to put your hand in this beaker. That's right. Only my voice, nothing else at all, that's right. Now, when you open your eyes, you're going to be aware that the beaker is still there in front of you. But beside you, you'll be aware that there's a man who's been responsible for all of the nuisance today, all of the discomfort. And you're going to become more and more annoyed at him as you think about that. In fact, you're going to take, pick up the beaker and throw the contents right at him. You're going to take the beaker and you'll feel good doing that. All right, and you'll do it quickly. Open your eyes, you'll see the beak in front of you. Pick it up and throw it at him, throw it at him. That's it. As you saw, we changed the acid for colored water while the subject's eyes were closed. The subject not only couldn't see this, but wasn't really aware of it because the smell of the acid was strong enough in the area to be quite compelling. Yet she threw the acid, what she thought was acid, at someone else. By the same token, she picked up the rattlesnake and she was willing to take a penny out of the fuming acid. The reason why you, she did it, however, was not so much the fact that she was hypnotized, but the fact that she knew that I couldn't afford to have anybody be hurt 
and I wouldn't want anybody to be hurt, and for that reason she trusted me. And it was the trust that mattered. Nevertheless, the subjects put themselves in what appeared to be danger and carried out their instructions while under hypnosis. But can this power of suggestion be used for positive ends to enable people to do something they want to, but can't? An example is the use of hypnosis as an investigative tool in law enforcement. This man is retired FBI agent Richard Doucet, now a consulting hypnotist with Dr. William Kroger, psychiatrist and specialist in the field of hypnosis and hypnotherapy. Both were involved in the solving of the famous Chowchilla kidnapping case. The subject sitting in front of them is Edward Ray, the bus driver from the case. You're going back to the time when you were taken away by those kids. Uh, Mr. Ray is now in a deep state of relaxation as evidenced by his slow, regular, rhythmic breathing. We're ready now, Mr. you just say? Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Scientific hypnosis was employed in the Chowchilla kidnapping case immediately after the 26 frightened school children and their bus driver, Ed Ray, dug their way out of their makeshift prison. The phenomenon was used as a memory enhancement device to help Ed Ray think and remember better, particularly concerning the license numbers of the kidnapped vans he had seen during the abduction and tried so desperately to memorize. Now, Ed, I'm now going to have you listen to Mr. Doucet, and you will follow everything that he asks you to say, and you will listen to everything that he asks you to listen to. It's July 16th. 1976, it's about 4.15 this afternoon, and you're guiding your bus back toward Chowchilla along Road 16. As you look up ahead, tell me what you see. I see a white van. Go ahead. When That's I, fine. When I get closer, the front door is open, open, open over the white line. I just load to go around it. Do you see anyone there? Yeah, a man with two guns. One looked like a shotgun, the other one looked like a toy gun. Do you see his face? No, he had a mask on it. And what are you doing? And what is he saying to you? And what are you saying to him, if anything? He said, open the door. Open the door. Do you do that? Yeah. Open the door. And what's happening now? Two, two men come in. One poked me with a gun. He said, get to the rear of the bus. And they just poked me and told me, get to the back of the bus. So we're moving ahead in time now. You're now inside the van, in the quarry, and you're sealed below. What are the children doing? A lot of them are crying. A lot of them are crying? Yeah. Don't see their mama no more. I see. Now, what are you doing now to correct this situation? Following mattresses up, hope to escape. All right. And then what? I piled them up and I couldn't raise that steel plate, it was so heavy. So there was a board down below. I went back and got it and I tried to steal it back a little. All right. All right. I just took care of the kids and stuff there. All right. Now, Ed, you're just sinking deeper and deeper into hypnosis. And in the darkened theater of your mind, you now begin to see the vans that transported you from the creek bed to the rock quarry. With every breath you take, focus and direct your attention to the license plate on the white van. The number now is becoming larger and larger with every breath you take larger 
larger and larger and larger. It's as big as a signboard on that screen in your mind. At the count of three, you will call out this number exactly as you see it. At the count of three. One, two, three. What is the number? One, C, eight, one, four, one, four. Very good. Now direct and focus your attention exclusively on the other van. This number is becoming bigger and bigger. It's frozen in place before your eyes, there in the darkened theater of your mind. At the count of three, you will repeat the number exactly as you see it, precisely and exactly. One, two, and three. What is the number, Ed? One, three, eight, one, four, one, four. At this stage, the Chowchilla kidnapping was still unsolved. In hypnosis, Ed Ray was able to produce two series of license numbers. One series, with the exception of a digit, matched a license plate number jotted down by a suspicious neighbor who lived in the area of the rock quarry and who had noticed vans cruising in the area two days before Ed and the children were abducted. Now this information became even more meaningful, and a massive investigation was launched by local police, the sheriff's office, and special agents of the FBI. A check with the California Department of Motor Vehicles produced a phony registration for the vans. But an intensive and well-organized and planned investigation soon linked three defendants to the vehicles. They were identified as three young men, the sons of wealthy Northern California parents. They were taken into custody, tried and convicted in California court. They're now serving life sentences, two without possibility of parole. How can we evaluate memories that come forward under hypnosis? Does the mind reflect reality, or does it generate its own world? Subjects, while hypnotized, may seem to relive past lives or appear to join the world of the future. While science raises questions about its meaning, the experience still remains. Back, back into time. This is Dr. Helen Crawford, a psychologist from the University of Wyoming, doing important research in the field of hypnosis. Five. Hi, Kelly. Hi. How old are you? Six. Six? Where do you live? La Sierra. Uh-huh. And what's today? Today's Wednesday. Uh-huh. What have you been doing? I've been in class all day. Class all day? Can you write your name? Yeah. Would you write your name for me, please? I can spell my last name, too. Can you? Would you do it, please? How long have you been able to do that? Just since the beginning of the year. Since the beginning of the year. That's very good. Who's your teacher? Mrs. Connecticut. Uh-huh. Just close your eyes now for a moment. And now you're going back, back into time. 1960, 50. 40, 1930, 1900, early, way back in the 1800s. I want you to go back to an important time in your life. And at the count of three, you will be there. One, two, three. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Rebecca. 
Rebecca? Rebecca what? Rebecca Brown. Uh-huh. And how old are you, Rebecca? Eighteen. Eighteen? Where do you live? Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico? Or where? Albuquerque. It's just in the west. It's in the west? It's west territory. The west territory. Uh-huh. And what do you do? I just help my mom and then go see my dad once in a while. Mm-hmm. What does your mother do? She's a, a wife, uh -huh. and she helps around the house, and she makes dinner. Mm -hmm. And your father? He's a blacksmith. He puts shoes on the horses and just takes care of horses in the barn and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And does he do other types of repairs? Sometimes he fixes wheels on wagons and stuff. Mm -hmm. Does he ever repair cars? I don't know what that is. Okay. And how did you get here to Albuquerque? Wagon. By wagon? Did it take you a day? It took a long time. A long time? Lots of days. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why don't you just close your eyes for a moment now? That's right. We're going to go forward in time now. We're moving forward in time. 1920, 1930, 1940, that's right, 60, 70, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, 2030. You can look into the future and see yourself. Okay, open your eyes now. And your name? Kelly. Mm -hmm. And how old are you, Kelly? See, I think I'm 20, 30, 70 years old. 70 years old? Uh-huh. And what do you do? Well, I'm old and there's not much for me to do. There's all conveniences, so there's nothing really you can do. Everything's computerized. Your house? Yeah, totally. Totally computerized? Uh-huh. You've got a very interesting watch there. Can you tell me about it? Most people have these kind of watches. It just tells the time and the date and the temperature and tells your blood pressure and it tells you if you need something, like if you're diabetic, tells you when you need your shots and stuff like that. Really? Mm -hmm. And That's blind right. people use them so for their sight they can detect mm -hmm. where they're going. And what are you doing? Where do you live? I live on Earth still. There's not very many people left here, though. Not very many people left? No, they live in space colonies. Uh-huh. And what kind of clothes do we have? We just wear our normal suits that protect our skin and stuff from the atmosphere. Why do we need protection? Because the, the atmosphere is kind of deteriorating and it's just bad for your health now. Mm-hmm. You have a family? Yeah, but I don't see them very much anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's fine. Just close your eyes now. You're coming back, back in time, that's right. Age regression involves an increase in the vividness of memory. It also involves an increase in imagination. Some of the things are accurate and some of the things may not be historically accurate. Science generally considers reincarnation fantasies and uh, um, fantasies about the future as imaginal productions. As such, they may be quite interesting and important, even from a therapeutic point of view. While some drugs have long been used to alter men's perception, creating both frightening and beautiful worlds within his mind, hypnosis also shows that perception can be altered or distorted. Suggestions can be given to forget an incident, and the subject will forget. Fictitious events can be suggested, which the subject will not only believe, but may elaborate on. Through hypnosis, a new world can be created for the subject, and this world may coexist with his everyday reality. Focusing on my voice for the moment, everything else seems far away, far away, far away, sinking deeper. As your hand drops down, you hear only my voice. You can hear nothing else. Can you hear anything else? No. That's right. Now, as you open your eyes, you're going to be able to see 
Dr. Crawford sitting in the chair. You know Dr. Crawford. You were talking with her a few minutes ago. And she's been interested in what we were doing. She wants to ask you a few questions about how you feel. Would you mind answering her? Not at all. Okay. Go ahead, Helen. It's all right. Very deep. Oh, about 18 on the scale. That is on a scale of 20, or a scale of... No, it's a top of scale. Ah. We, at Stanford, we use a scale that goes all the way up. I see. And Dr. Crawford and I use it, and she asked me when I, how far I'm under. I see. Yeah, I could go deeper, but I have to go back under again. No, I feel really good. Thank you. Good. I want you to go ahead and touch Dr. Crawford's right hand with your right hand. It's okay. Tell me, uh, who is this behind you here? I don't know. Look carefully. I'd like you to be able to see whether you recognize her. Who is that? It's Dr. Crawford. Now, who does... Is this a man or a woman? It's a woman. And whom does she look like? Dr. Crawford. And who does this look like? That is Dr. Crawford. And who is this? Well, I mean, who does she look like? She looks like Dr. Crawford, but she's not. She can't be. Well, how is she dressed? She's wearing the same thing. Can you touch her right hand and see whether there's any difference? None. Now, if she looks like her, how come? It's probably just, I don't know, makeup or something. One of the crew, I don't know. Why don't you ask this lady? Who, who are you? Dr. Crawford. She can't be doctor. Dr. Dr. Crawford just said it. Why don't you ask her some more questions? See whether she would know the things which Dr. Crawford would know. Can I ask Dr. Crawford? Sure. Dr. Crawford, is that someone that you know? Me either. No, I've never worked with her at Stanford. All right. Have you ever been at Stanford? Yes, I have. What do I do? I mean... In one of these is an image, and one is the real Dr. Crawford. Well, I know the real doctor. Well, keep an open mind about it. Well, now, why don't you decide what she should do, whether she should... You think about something which she ought to do. Yeah, but she just heard you say that... No, no. You think about it. Don't tell me. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Decide what she should do. She just did it. And she didn't. Now, how would Dr. Crawford have known what to do if you didn't say it? I guess she wouldn't. That's right. Then who ought to be the real Dr. Crawford? Yes, she would. Mm -hmm. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment, go back into trance, and this time I'll ask you to wake up and to remember everything that has happened. Are you ready to wake up? Three, two, one, wide awake. <sighs> That's weird. The mind controlling pain is a phenomenon known since ancient times. Medical science of today has begun to appreciate the importance and power of suggestion in the healing process. But the real test of the power of hypnosis over pain would be demonstrated by this man, Dr. William Kroger. What you are about to see is the performance of major surgery without drugs or anesthesia, only hypnosis. Any time that I touch your left shoulder like this, this will be a cue that you will alert yourself, opening your eyes, feeling wonderful, without a headache, and feeling just grand. Anytime I touch your right shoulder, like this, with your permission, and I can't even do it unless you want me to, that will be a signal for you to go into a deep, if not state. And now, Roberta, you're going to go into a deep, if not state, way down, deeper and deeper. 
and I'm going to produce love anesthesia for you. I'm going to stroke this hand, and it's going to get numb, heavy, and wooden-like. And when you're sure that this hand has become numb and heavy and wooden-like, just like your gums would feel as when a dentist has injected Novocaine into them, that numb, heavy, wooden-like feeling, you will then transfer this anesthesia to your neck. As soon as you feel this numb, heavy, wooden feeling, transfer the anesthesia to your neck, and then press your palm of your left hand close to your neck, and then when you're certain that that anesthesia has been transferred from the hand to the neck, you will then drop your hand and your arm. You're going deeper and deeper relaxed with every breath you take. And you can just feel that numbness being transferred from the hand to the neck. That's fine. Seven sessions were required to condition the patient rather than one or two. On the morning of surgery, the patient was awakened from a sleep induced only by post-hypnotic suggestion. On the operating table, Roberta was instructed to deepen her own hypnotic state, as she had been trained to do. The extreme muscular relaxation of her arm when it falls to her side is as profound as those produced by any type of relaxing drug. During this time, Roberta was asked whether she would prefer the hypnotherapist to induce the anesthesia, but she indicated that she preferred the glove anesthesia method which she had learned herself. After the self-administered anesthesia of the neck, I induced a rigid catalepsy of the entire body. The nurse attended was an anesthetist so that we could switch to anesthesia if the hypnosis did not work. Notice that no superficial bleeders had to be tied off during the incision. The surgeon also noted that there was far less bleeding for this type of a procedure than that which usually occurs. Roberta was kept informed of the entire operation and talked to the surgical scene frequently because at no time did she show the slightest signs of pain. Speed is not essential, as hypnosis can be maintained for long intervals in good hypnotic subjects. I should like to emphasize that only about 10% of patients are able to obtain a deep enough state so that hypnosis can be substituted for conventional anesthesia. Contrary to popular opinion, Roberta's state is not that of a trance, sleep state, or unconsciousness, but rather is characterized by an increase of all the senses except the feeling of pain, which has been effectively blocked. She was able to talk to us in a manner that ordinarily would not have been possible for several hours. I'd like to emphasize that to the best of my knowledge, this is the first operation of this type to be performed totally under hypnosis without any drugs whatsoever. While pain can be controlled by hypnosis, the skill is really with the subject and not with the hypnotist. Therefore, the subject who has learned self-hypnosis can also control his own pain. It is fascinating how the mind alone can control pain, can eliminate pain during major surgery. This skill depends upon the individual's ability to enter a profound state of hypnosis. Dr. Lewinstein from the University of California School of Medicine, an anesthesiologist, has had extensive experience with hypnosis and with self-hypnosis, both with himself and in teaching it to his patients. Could you kind of describe a little bit what, it, what you've used self-hypnosis for? I've used it. Um for control of pain uh, when starting intravenous infusions and also for post-operative pain. Would you mind kind of uh, demonstrating uh, what you do to put yourself in trance and uh, how you control pain? Not at all. Um, I've gotten to the point where I can spontaneously go into a trance and all that's really necessary is to 
just put my arm up like this. With my hand in this position, I can just allow it to dissociate and become cataleptic. And if you'd like, we can use a finger signal, an idiomotor signal when it has dissociated and is analgesic. Right, and at that point you would feel no discomfort in it. Correct. Right, looks like that's happening. Now, you discussed earlier that you could, for example, stick a needle through it, a spinal needle, and it wouldn't bother you. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Would, would you mind demonstrating that? Not at point? all. All right, this is a, a spinal needle here. Um, would you perhaps want to take that? Okay. It's a 22 gauge spinal needle. Right, and let me just uh, lift up a fold for you here so that you can. Okay, and I can just put that right through like that. Just like that. Right. Could you tell me what the feeling is like, what you experience in the arm right now? Uh -huh. I can see that it's there, but I don't feel it and it doesn't bother me. And you wouldn't have discomfort regardless, pretty much, of what was done with that hand? No, I could have major surgery on that hand. Mm -hmm. That would not bother me. We have learned the powers of the mind. That the mind can be controlled by others, both for good or evil. The mind can control the body and, through imagination, can even control itself. In the time of Mesmer, this phenomenon was thought to be due to a magnetic fluid. Today, we know the power of hypnosis resides within the subject. Man has also learned that the mind is a two-edged sword on one side, when under his control, it is a powerful tool for reasoning, solving problems, imagining, appreciating life, even healing. But there is also the dangerous side. For when it is allowed to be open to outside suggestion, it can be used against him to manipulate and to control him through another's will. Many of the secrets of controlling one's mind were known in the past. Today, we are rediscovering those mysteries. And with that knowledge, applied by each of us, we can become impervious to the power of a Hitler or a Jones. For by using this power ourselves, no longer can others keep us from our destiny. Or can they? I would respect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. There's nothing to death, it's like Max said, it's just stepping over into another plane. Don't, don't be this way. Stop this hysteric. This is not the way for people who are socialist to communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. We must die with some dignity. Hurry, hurry, my children, hurry. All I say, does not fall in the hands of the enemy. Hurry, my children. Hurry, there's seniors out here that I'm concerned about. Hurry. I don't want to leave my seniors to this mess. We've said 1,000 people who say we don't like the way the world is. Stop. Take our life from us. We laid it down. We got tired. We didn't commit suicide. We can an act of revolutionary suicide protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. 